Well, it's time for Tyler to tune us favorite time of year, not only according to College 12 Pack with me, your host, Patrick Hahn, but uh, it is the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Y'all still call it that, right? I mean, in this, in this world where everybody keeps changing names, I'm hoping it's still that. Oh yeah, the fans do. I mean, it's not official. Like they won't officially call it that because it's. Uh, I, I. I don't. I mean, it's the most accurate descriptor for that game I've ever heard. Uh, but I guess they want to shy away from that now. But oh yeah, we still call it that. And we are going to get into that. Uh, but there's this crazy story going around uh, that we're going to get into first. Tyler, when you hear the words manifesto, do you get a little nervous? Yeah, I mean, you know, it usually doesn't precede good things uh, when you're discussing someone's manifesto, certainly. Uh, well, we're, what we're referring to is Connor Stallions. If you've heard about this hand signal gate, that's just what I'm calling it. But um, there is a lot out there right now. Apparently, the NCAA is investigating Michigan once again. A lot of people thought, oh, well, this is the NCAA just going after Michigan once more, but seems like there's a lot to this. Uh, over the course of three years, Connor Stallions personally, and this is a, a low-level assistant in Michigan, uh, according to everything that I've seen, is uh, bought tickets on both sides of at the 40-yard line, 45-yard line on both sides of several uh, games, in, including the – uh, multiple college football playoff contenders, as well as almost all of the Big Ten teams, uh, and recorded those from all the reports. And, and this is, I'm just paraphrasing here because I don't have the reports in front of me, uh, but recording the sidelines. And then when you see pictures and video, more specifically the Ohio State game on 2022. Uh, it pretty much looks like uh, Mr. Connor Stallings is holding a laminated sheet with hand signals. Uh, Tyler, what do you make of this? And and is this one of the more wild stories going on in college football right now? Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, especially given everything that was already going on in Michigan, you know, before any of this came out. I mean, so, yeah, like you said, you know, Stallions not not going to these games himself. You know, he's usually there on the sidelines with Michigan, but he's forwarding these tickets on to other people. They're usually, you know, facing the, the, the sideline of the team, whatever particular team that they are alleged to be scouting. Um, and, you know, a lot of times with things like this, I might be like, yeah, we'll see. I don't know if anything's going to come of it. And that might end up being the case. But, I mean, Look, Big Ten teams are tripping over themselves right now to to put it out there to the media that they have evidence of this. You know, apparently the NCAA is going to receive uh, like video surveillance evidence of, of them doing this and recording at the stadiums. So, I mean, we'll certainly see what comes out of it. You know, they, they seem to be very confident that they've got uh, that there's a lot of smoke here. Um, you know, I, I mean, like, look, I. I would be being dishonest if I sat up here and acted like I really care that much about this. I, I, I don't really care that much. But to me, the much bigger issue here, and really is, is the issue with, with cheating in college sports always, is the lack of discretion. You know, when, when you know, back in the days where, where you couldn't pay players, you know, we knew it was happening. We knew it was happening pretty much everywhere, but only a small select group of schools would get in trouble for it. And people would be like, why did that happen? It's because only a small select group of schools are, are brazen enough about it to, to get caught, you know, and I think that's kind of what's happening here. I mean, he was buying these tickets under his own name with his own credit card and, and you know, Venmoing people with his own account. Like, I mean, that to me is the much bigger issue, because if you're going to cheat like this, you got to at least be discreet about it. You got to take the Kevin Durant approach and have multiple burners. We're talking burner accounts you know, cash cards, whatever you got to do. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting because here I was looking at the Columbus Dispatch uh, and they had, had written about this. And I said, according to ESPN, Stallions had tickets on both sides of Ohio Stadium for the Buckeyes matchup against the Nittany Lions that were not used. The tickets were reportedly facing each bench. Now, whether or not that they were used, it, it makes you go wonder, you know, how many other games did they buy these for and actually do that uh, for those games? So they're in the NCAA is in the process of obtaining video evidence for illegal technology used in scouting. And I, and I think you you made an excellent point uh, when you looked at the recruiting aspect of it and paying players. 
and I the key word is the people who got caught. You know, I think there are teams out there, especially advanced scouting uh, departments that are doing these type of things, trying to get an edge. Uh, but I think Matt Rule has a, a perfect way uh, to fix this issue, and that simply put is helmet technology, uh, which is something that I know they banned, and I, we've talked about this, banned due to the fact that, you know, the, the smaller schools didn't want to pay for it. But what's stopping the NCAA from reaching an agreement, a deal with a technology company like Bose, Motorola, whatever? I don't know. Is Motorola still a thing, Tyler? I, I, I might be <laughs> I might be aging myself there, but regardless, I think that they need to have some kind of technology equipment um, that could alleviate some of this. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, that's the no brainer solution here. And, you know, I thought uh, Bud Elliott from 247 Sports, he pointed this out on Twitter. Really a good point is that, you know, the, the reason that, that sending scouts on the road to away games is against the rules is not because it was deemed to be this like super unethical, uh, you know, uh, thing that gives you a massive competitive edge. It's because smaller schools didn't want to pay to send scouts out on the road. And so, you know, they standardized the rules to make it fair for everyone. And that's the same reason, by the way, that you don't have uh, helmet communication like you do in the NFL is because the smaller schools didn't want to pay for it. So I think the great irony of this whole situation is it, you know, that that logic is going to kind of lead to, to one rule changing to, to solve the other one. Um, you know, I mean, like and, you know, like I said, I don't really care that much about it, but it seems like people do. And, and to me, this is different from the paying players thing in the sense that, like, I don't know, maybe I'm off base with this, but I feel like there's certain elements of cheating that people are kind of OK with. Like, I think to paying players in college football, I think to even like you know, the steroid era in baseball, even, you know, that is kind of a mix how people feel about it. But this is a lot more like, you know, the Astros thing where I think it's a little bit more cut and dry and uh, the, not the kind of thing that people are necessarily um, okay with sweeping under the rug. So, I mean, we'll certainly see what comes from this, but if there's as much evidence as they have, I mean, they could get hit. And I think we'll certainly see some changes to how the sport operates in terms of signaling and stuff like that. Like we were kind of alluding to. I will, I will say this as the last uh, thing I'm going to say on this topic, you know, it, it's interesting because I came from covering the NFL to going to college. And that was one of the things that kind of shocked me uh, really when you really dive into it. And it was the, like the helmet technology. The other thing is, is uh, mandatory injury reports, which I actually think the college sports should go with as well. Uh, competitive advantage. I, I, you know, air force, uh, versus Navy. They had to deal with that this past weekend with the quarterback situation for Air Force. Uh, that's all I'm going to say on that. I I, I think it's a uh, a thing that they're going to have to address, and I think they're going to have to fix it that way. Um, that there, I don't think there's any other way around it, but, you know, if all the coaches start talking about helmet technology, uh, we could be going back to that helmet technology. Now let's talk about the games, a few of the games this weekend that, that matter. And we'll start with the 101... 101st, one, I don't know where I got that from, 101st <laughs> meeting of the world's largest outdoor cocktail party between Florida and Georgia. Uh, how excited are you for this, and how close of a game could this be? I know Georgia will be missing their best player, uh, Brock Bowers, as he uh, recovers from the injury that required surgery. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm stoked. You know, like every year it kind of the debate kind of renews like should this game stay in jacksonville should it become a home and home with maybe a rotation in like atlanta and jacksonville look i mean i'm biased because i'm born and raised in jacksonville i live here now but i just love this game so much it's awesome i mean there, we talked about it a little earlier in the year really the only comparison to this game is that uh oklahoma texas game in dallas at the cotton bowl like it's so special just having you know the neutral site the field split 50 50 it's an amazing atmosphere i've gone to the game a lot um and it's just it's just a lot of fun so i'm very much looking forward to it as far as the actual game i mean look i'm a lot more optimistic about florida's chances than i would have been if brock bowers was playing i mean i'll say that right now i think it can't really be understated how much their offense flows through him. I mean, he is such a focal point for, for being a tight end. I mean, that's not really something you see. We kind of saw it with Florida in 2020 with Kyle Pitts, but to have a tight end be a focal point of the offense like that is something pretty special. Um, and, you know, we haven't really gotten to see what that's going to look like without him. You know, they're, they're not hurting for talent at the skill positions. They've got it, but 
we just don't really know what this offense is going to look like. And it's going to, you know, be a challenge for Carson Beck against a defense that I think is solid. It's been inconsistent. They've got a lot of young guys playing, especially in the secondary, and that's hurt them at times this year. And I think depending on what kind of game you get, that'll kind of, you know, dictate how that goes. I'm really interested, though, in what Florida could do offensively in this game. Uh, I mean, I, it's, they've in recent weeks sort of been developing a bit of a downfield passing game. They did it a bit against Vandy, had to do it to beat South Carolina. They're going to have to do it to stay competitive in this game. You will not beat Georgia trying to beat them the way they tried to beat Kentucky. It's going to go like that game did or, or worse if you try to do that. Um so I think they're going to have to get the downfield passing game. I think they will to an extent, like Auburn hit some plays on these guys. I don't think Florida wins, but I will say this. Here's my bold prediction. Maybe I'm a homer. Call me that if you want. Florida keeps this one within a touchdown. Yeah, homer alert for sure. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think you make some good points. I, I mean, I don't think that they lose this football game. I don't think Georgia does. Uh, and it would be historic if they were to lose this game for Florida, who has never beaten an AP number one ranked team while being unranked themselves. Uh, so that would be a historic victory. However, uh, I, I don't see it as as a team that I don't think Florida has enough talent. I Looking at them right now, uh, give Napier some more time, and I, and I think he closes the gap a little bit. Uh, that being said, I would not be surprised if Georgia lost this game. I just don't think that they do. Yeah, I mean, that, like, I don't either. Like, I mean, I would be pretty surprised if Florida pulled this off just because I think, I think really they would have to deliver a game on defense that I'm not sure this unit is capable of doing yet. I'm actually a, becoming a little bit more optimistic about where the offense is at. Now, if they just get dominated up front, the offensive line, then it could be a different story. And that's the weakness on this group. So that that is what concerns me a little bit. You know, they just kept running into stacked boxes against Kentucky, and that went about as well as you would expect. So – you know, we'll see how that goes this time. But I think that Florida might be able to keep this one a little bit competitive, especially because I just, like I said, I don't know what to make of Georgia without Brock Bowers. I don't think it can be understated um, how big of an impact that might have. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm with you there. Let's talk about the game of the week. Two top 15 teams. We have Utah going up against Oregon. This, this is an interesting matchup. You know, Utah coming off the big win against USC, who's got all kinds of problems right now. Do you think US or I'm sorry, Utah has enough offense to stick with Oregon in this game? Uh, we did see how they were able to score late and score often against USC, but I think we both agree that uh, at least Oregon has a competent defense. Yeah, for sure. You know, Utah, man, this team keeps burning me. I no matter whether I pick them, whether I whether I pick them, whether I pick against them, it doesn't matter. You know, I picked them to beat uh, Oregon State, got that one wrong. I picked them to lose to USC last week, got that one wrong. So I'm really bad at predicting this Utah team, obviously. But with that being said, I mean, I, I do like Oregon in this game. I think. Oregon is miles ahead of where USC is defensively, especially up front. I mean, they really are like, I think an SEC team caliber, at least as far as the way their front seven plays. So I think that's going to make things tough. You know, I don't think Bryson Barnes is going to have nearly the kind of game he had last week against USC, you know, all, no disrespect to him. You know, he's playing his heart out right now, but I think that was a bit of a flash in the pan kind of game from them offensively. And, you know, USC I think we're we're pretty high on this Utah defense, but USC still put up 30 on them. I mean, it wasn't Caleb's best game, but they, you know, he moved the ball on him. It wasn't an issue. So I expect Oregon to have similar success. I, I just I don't really see a game state where this goes that well for Utah. The only reason I'm even, you know, considering it at all is just because of the way they play. They're always seem to be competitive, and I always seem to be wrong about them. You know, I have to roll with the Ducks in this one just because I think Bo Nix, who's playing at a, a pretty high level this year, leads the nation with 78.4 completion percentage. I don't know if you know this, but he is the first quarterback since the year 2000 to eclipse the 78% um, completion percentage. The only other guy to do it was some guy named Joe Burrow in 2019. <laughs> if that just shows you on what kind of level that Bo Nix has been playing on, he's doing a fantastic job, and I think he is a big reason why I believe that Oregon's going to win this game. I think it's close. I do think it's close, but I do think Oregon's going to win it just because they play a little bit better defense, 
And uh, which quarterback do I trust more in a big game, Bryson Barnes or Bo Nix? I'm going to go with Bo Nix in this one. I think what he is able to do, running the football, throwing the football, getting the ball to his weapons. I, I just think that there's, you know, while USC was loaded on offense, um, they'll be able to take advantage when their defense can come up with some big plays for them. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Like, I think that, you know, Oregon was, you know, like we talked about after that game, if they had converted one of those three fourth down attempts, they probably win that game and we're probably talking about them a lot differently right now. Um, and I think we're still really high on them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see any reason that, that Oregon should struggle in this game you know, beyond the fact that it's a competent team and well-coached team. But I mean, to me, the talent should clearly win out here in a way that I'm not surprised that it didn't for USC last week, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Here And here is another reason why I'm, I'm going to pick the Ducks in this. Uh, I don't know that I can trust Utah to come from behind. And Oregon is the best team in the country at starting fast. Plus 17 first half point differential. I think if they get up three scores early, 17 points on Utah. That might be all she wrote. Like I said, it'll be close, but I just don't think they have enough offense to overcome uh, what Oregon can do. And and now we're going to go into a game that's a little different. Big 12 game. BYU comes to Austin for the first time since 2014. Uh, They won that game handedly that year, 41-7, to during the Charlie Strong era. Uh, But I think... Texas, even though they're going to be dealing with a quarterback issue, given that Quinn Ewers is not going to be able to play because of the AC joint strain in his throwing shoulder, uh, likely he's going to sit the next two games, I would guess. Um, He's week to week, but I would guess it's probably at least two weeks before he's going to get ramped up again. I still think even with Malik Murphy running it, running the offensive quarterback, they've got a lot of talent, especially when you talk about their wide receiver group with Xavier Worthy, when you look at Adonai Mitchell, uh, and then you look at the running backs, Jonathan Brooks, C.J. Baxter. uh, I think they have more than enough offense to overcome uh, a deficiency at quarterback. And even though we haven't really seen Malik Murphy, uh, there will be some of a deficiency, but it'll be interesting to see how he progresses uh, while he is filling in with for Quinn Ewers. Yeah, agreed. You know, I think that there will come a time this season, depending on how long Quinn you or I should say there could come a time this season, depending on how long Quinn Ewers is out, uh, where, you know, that will cost them not having him available. I don't think this is the game where it does. Um, I think they shouldn't have any issues, even with Malik Murphy, who, you know, like I said uh, on Monday, you know, a guy that they were really high on, you know, I mean, there's a reason he's he's sitting above Arch Manning on that depth chart right now. I mean, obviously, Arch is a true freshman, I'm sure has a ways to go, but, you know, big time recruit, you know, says a lot that Malik Murphy's, you know, the guy that they're turning to in this situation. And, you know, I'm curious, I I think, like I said, I don't expect them to struggle. I don't think they'll lose this game, but I am curious what the drop-off looks like if there is any at all, because I think it'll tell us a lot about, you know, how necessary Quinn Ewers getting back soon is for this team to keep its, you know, playoff hopes alive. Cause I mean, if they drop a game, it's all, it's all but over. Whereas I think if we feel, we both feel like if they went out, beat Oklahoma again, or sorry, get their revenge against Oklahoma, they're probably in the playoff, but I, it's going to be hard to, to predict that if we see, you know, this offense take a considerable step back. Um, but again, I, you know, this week shouldn't be a problem. You know, BYU offensively doesn't really scare you. And Texas is a really good team on that, on the defensive side of the ball. So shouldn't have any issues. Just, just want to see if Malik Murphy is kind of turnkey in that regard. You know, here's an interesting note. If Texas wins this game, it will be the first time that Steve Sarkeesian started seven and one as a head coach in any season through the first eight games. Steve Sarkeesian is also going up against the team he used to quarterback in 95 and 96. Uh, so going up against the alma mater, the last time that he went up against them, it did not go well. Uh, BYU won that game 23 to 17. Uh, so for uh, for Sark, it's an opportunity to get a couple of a uh, couple of firsts, the first victory against his alma mater, and to start seven and one. Uh, this this is my bold prediction. I think uh, I think Jonathan Brooks goes off for 200 yards rushing in this game. I, I just I think that they're going to lean on the running game, and uh, I think that. 
Uh, Brooks will have his second 200 plus yard rushing a performance of the year after the one that he had against Kansas earlier in the season. Yeah, I like that prediction, especially if, you know, I'm sure BYU is going to expect them to lean on the run game. If Malik Murphy can hit a couple big plays in the passing game, make them respect it, that'll really open things up for what I think could be a huge day for the ground game. I agree. Okay, and then we're going to move on to the final game uh, before we get into a little hot seat discussion here on the College 12-pack. Uh, Duke versus Louisville. Uh, Duke, obviously, they tried to go with Riley Leonard last week against Florida State. Didn't look good. Tweaked his ankle again. Had to leave the game. Uh, and this was a game that Duke had led uh, early in that game, first half. Both teams go scoreless in the third quarter before Florida State finally broke through. Uh, scored 21 unanswered in the fourth quarter to get that victory. Uh, going into this game, I think Louisville, uh, much like they did last time out against Pitt, uh, they're going to hard. They're going to have a hard time uh, going up against this Mike Elko defense, who clearly has shown that uh, they can slow you down. And if they can get a little bit of offense from the uh, Duke backups, uh, I, I think that they clearly. I think they can win this football game. Yeah, you know, so Riley Leonard, kind of uncertain status again. You know, that was the case last week. He ended up playing. I'd probably ex expect that he won't. Um, you know, they he was already returning pretty fast from a high ankle sprain, re-aggravating it. I, I just don't know. With, with what's still potentially on the table for this team, I don't know if it's worth je jeopardizing his health further. Uh, even again, you know, this is by no means a, a game that you can sleepwalk in. I mean, they're underdogs. I, I think that... Um, I think if Riley Leonard were to play, even if he were to play at, you know, 80%, I think they'd win this game easily. Uh, even without him, though, I don't know what to make of Louisville. I think that, you know, the Notre Dame game, I, they're obviously improved, just to be clear. Like, this is a, a good year one for Jeff Rom, like, no doubt about it. I think that that Notre Dame game may have been a flash in the pan, though, a little bit. And when you look at the rest of the schedule, I'm not sure how much I believe in them. You know, Duke even with Henry Beal in the fourth uh, without Riley Leonard a couple weeks ago, you know, got the job done against NC state. I, I think this one will be tougher than that, but I like Duke to win. So here's, here's my lock, which is also sort of a bold prediction, I guess um, Duke, who's a four point underdog, I believe in this game. Last I checked, uh, they win this game outright and win by two scores. Win by two scores. Uh, my lock, uh, my lock of the week is Jordan waters is going off in this game. Uh, he, he leads the team with nine rushing touchdowns. I think he gets three more in this game. And I think that they're able to slow down that Louisville offense with defensively. Uh, and, this, you know, it's going to be old school type of football in this game, I think. Defense and running the football, ball control offense, I think is the way that Duke gets back on track this week uh, and picks up a win to try and stay in that ACC title race. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they can get this win, I think they're in a pretty good position. You know, we'll see what happens. They get North Carolina later in the year, and North Carolina still has to play Clemson. So that's, I think, a bit of a toss-up game. And if Duke can get the win over North Carolina, they'd have the inside track. Maybe they get healthy and get another shot at Florida State, you know, not you know, on, in a, on a neutral field. Okay, so let's get into our final topic of the college 12-pack for this week. Uh, let's talk hot seat. Now, if you've gone to college sports wire – uh, .usa today .com. Uh, in the last couple of days, you saw our hot seat list. Uh, Tyler, is there anybody that kind of stood out to you? Um, I thought it was an opportunity to kind of check in. I mean, we've heard Jimbo Fisher's name a lot. He's the name that we hear all the time. Uh, but is there somebody else on that list who you're, you're looking at going, yeah, he's definitely uh, heating up uh, as the season progresses? Yeah, I mean, so the Jimbo thing, real quick, like, I, I feel like to me, it seems like it's just a matter of time at this point. I, I don't think this year, it's not been bad, but it hasn't been the leap I think he needed. You know, I think if they're willing to pay the $76 million, maybe they don't do it this year, but I don't know why. If you are if you can mobilize and get $76 million, I don't see why you would put yourself, set yourself back another year just to make that $67 million. I, I, that's just my logic on that one. We'll see what happens there. I mean, obviously we can talk about, you know, on, on y'all's list at college sports wire, you know, you only have one guy on the highest tier and he's a coordinator. Uh, you know, Brian Ferentz, I mean, you know, we'll see what happens there. Like, you know, you mentioned the contract and, and, you know, we all know like he's, 
he's got to hit that 25 point a game mark allegedly that's in you know that's what the contract says they're not anywhere close to doing that so i mean any hopes of that happening are, are all but out the window at this point the question you i guess have to ask yourself is a couple things first of all would brian not just leave voluntarily rather than go through the embarrassment of that would kirk not just potentially retire to avoid that all going down and the athletic director that put that in the contract uh, is no longer there. So could the university try to say that it's not no longer valid? All those are possible options. I'm not sure this ends with the university saying, sorry, Brian, you did not hit 325 points and you are fired. Uh, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because I believe it was a radio host there uh, in Iowa City that was actually – saying kind of that uh, it's time for not only Brian parents to go, it's time to Kirk parents to go. Um, the offense under, under him, under his leadership has just been atrocious over the last several years, but here's an interesting one to me, Sam Pittman at Arkansas, just what's going on. He's approaching Chad Morris territory. And if, if you uh, don't know the history of Chad Morris and Razorback fans, uh, ask any of them, uh, and they'll tell you that you do not want to be in his company uh, one bit when it comes to Arkansas football history. Yeah, and, you know, I think it is important to kind of set a distinction there because I think part of the reason Sam Pittman has built up so much goodwill is because he's not Chad Morris. You know, it, he – he turned them around pretty quickly and the actual record isn't great, but the competence improved quite a bit. And there's something to be said for that. Like this was not really a hire that anyone had massively high expectations for. It's worked out pretty well, but you know, you're two and six, the losing streak is tough. I mean, they were competitive in losses to good teams every week up until this one, when, you know, you lose seven to three to Mississippi state KJ Jefferson doesn't have a good game at all. After the game, Sam Pittman's asked, like, is he hurt? Like, what, what's going on here? Like, it didn't look like he was getting it all out of his throws. And Sam Pittman was basically just like, I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. He's not he's not hurt as far as I know. So it, that, it was just a very telling post game for him to me. It didn't it didn't sound very good. I think I'm not sure we see a firing there. I, I think that could end up being maybe more of a retirement slash mutual parting of ways university ambassador you know you know what i'm saying like that kind of that kind of breakdown um one other real quick that you had that i want to just briefly touch on that you had in uh in your second to highest hot seat category was tom allen at indiana who like i don't think anyone would argue that that thing is going well right now and it's not trending in a good direction all the positive returns from a couple years ago are all but gone the only issue there is his buyout is like 20 plus million dollars and it's Indiana football. And I don't know. I mean, I think whether Tom Allen is the coach of this team in 2024 will tell me a lot about whether this program is serious about football, um, you know, in the new era of the big 10. Yes. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, he, to me, you're right. When you look at the buyout information, it's bad. Uh but if I was going to accurately put Tom Allen on this list, it had to be second to highest. Uh, but I do want to go back to uh, go back to talk about Pittman for a moment. You know, it's just really interesting because now Dan Enos, who they brought in to replace Kendall Bryles, is no longer running the offense. He's gone. Uh, so I, that tells you there is some heat uh, going on in Fayetteville. Uh, and that's why I think this will come to a head at some point this year. Yeah. And, and he even, like I said, I just, I was watching his press conference after the game. I was curious what he was saying. And before they even fired Dan Enos, they asked him, you know, would you consider like a change at play caller, you know, a change with staffing? And he basically was just like, yeah, everything's on the table. Like we're evaluating it all. So that, I mean, that doesn't cert that certainly sounds like a coach who's, who's feeling some pressure, you know, I, I mean, We'll see. I don't know what, what Arkansas's identity looks like in this next era of, of what, what college football is about to be and what the SEC is about to be. But I do know, you know, teams that they recruit will be recruiting against in Texas and Oklahoma are about to join this conference. Like there is going to be a whole sort of Southwest wing of the conference. And, I, you know, I think Arkansas could probably make a splashier move uh, to, to set themselves up better in the future. Absolutely. But that's going to do it for this edition of the College 12-Pack. We'll be back next week recapping Florida, Georgia, Utah, Oregon, and get you ready for LSU, Alabama next week in Tuscaloosa. 
Uh, should be a fun week as we get to November. And, and there's some other big, big matchups coming uh, November 4th, including USC, Washington, uh, defense option uh, for that football game. Uh, but for Tyler, I'm Patrick. See you next week.